Well, my formal name is Maurice Joseph Gallagher, Jr. Uh, my father before me was the, the senior. And um, I have uh, been in the airline space primarily for the last 40 years. Um, I was fortunate to be involved in what's called airline deregulation in the late 70s in the United States. And um, uh, it's allowed me to have a career. And in, in, uh, as I joke, I can spell airplane. I've been doing it so long. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, do you mind if I just jump into some of the students' questions for you? Sure. Absolutely. So some of the students in France wanted to know, how, what sparked your original interest in aviation? Well, um, I can remember being fascinated by an airplane. Uh, a couple of things come to mind. I was in Kansas City, Missouri, and my father would take me down to the airport, which is right on the, the Missouri River there, uh, still is the old airport. And I know we'd watch airplanes take off and land. Uh, that was the headquarters for TWA and older airlines no longer around. And they were flying propeller airplanes. That shows you how old I am. Uh, Constellations it was quite a famous airplane uh, in the time. Three tails, uh, if you will. Um, and then uh, I have distinct memories of, uh, I was uh, driving a truck delivering asphalt to the O'Hare airport in the Chicago area in the 60s and uh, the 747 had just uh, been produced it was flying the first uh, generations and i remember driving on uh the, the ramp there and the shadow came over the truck and it stayed there for the longest time and it was the 747 that was just hanging in the air and you just had to be fascinated by it so uh, the the whole aspect uh, really got my attention and then with deregulation, I met some a uh, couple of gentlemen, one in particular who had been from the industry, and we decided to go into the management business uh, in 1979, and it's uh, haven't looked back since that time. Very good. So we uh, already have some questions from some of the students, and uh, I have a question from Mev in Italy, and Mev will kick us off. Uh, Mev, you should be able to unmute. You had a very good question for Mr. Gallagher. Hi, nice to meet you, Mr. Gallagher. Yes, ma'am, same here. <laughs> I would like to know, how have you seen trends change over the years in your career? Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, I've been uh, fortunate to be the uh, see technology change maybe as much as anybody's has. Uh, as my son likes to say I was born before fire was invented in, in cell phones. Um, when I started out in the 80s, 70s and 80s, we didn't have spreadsheets. We didn't have PCs. We didn't have the tools you're so used to working on. And I would do uh, projections by hand. Literally, you would have these spreadsheets that were pieces of paper, 13 columns wide, which allow you to do your 12 months plus your 13th column. And you would layer these things in as if you've worked on a spreadsheet at all and done projections that we do financially. So I started before that. And then uh, some of the first uh, programs that came out, uh, gosh, I've forgotten their names, but they were very crude and, and the like. And obviously all the PC work, uh, you know, back when in those days, for instance, you had an administrative person, typically, if you were in a, in a business situation that would take care of a lot of things. Today, I do virtually all my own administration because you can do it all on online and do that. So the productivity has been dramatic and perhaps even more so the amount of data we can get about what's going on. Uh, you know, ours, we're a small carrier compared to a lot, but we still carry almost 20 million people a year uh, and we'll fly, you know, hundreds of thousands of flights. So that's a lot of information that you really wanna be able to parse and understand and uh, do your, do your, build your business around. That's uh, great advice. And so um, some of the students in Spain wanted to know that uh, what, what sparked your interest with telecommunications? Because we know that you've delved into that. Yes. Well, um, I was, uh, well, a little history for the United States. The United States was a very regulated country and the world was for that matter in the 70s. Um, the deregulation of the United States in the 1970s from things like uh, transportation, the aviation business, trucking, rails, uh, banking was deregulated, uh, oil was deregulated. The government had their fingers in all of these businesses. And, uh, but you combine that with a uh, situation where there was a lot of inflation, uh, a lot of monetary policy going on in the 70s was a lost decade. 
And just to give you, uh, if any of you follow the stock market uh, in the U.S., the U.S. Dow Jones Industrial Average in 1982, this will give you a little quiz, what do you think it might be? Well, I'll tell you, it was 777. Today, the Dow Jones is 34,000, give or take. That's a factor that's substantial. And that's all wealth that's been created since that time. And so uh, the United States through deregulation really set up the world in itself to really you know, go on this run since the early 80s, where there's been tremendous growth in lots of different areas, not the least of which is just the wealth of the world. And, and wealth is like a, what they call a rising tide. It lifts all boats. It's really important that you have it universal across many people. Uh, in the case of the telecommunications business, what I saw, I was in between things, and what I saw is an opportunity not unlike the airline business with deregulation to get in and have an uh, advantage for a younger company to do things. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite deregulated the way it probably should have been, at least in my opinion. And um, uh, that was right in the middle of what we call the dot-com boom. That was the introduction of the internet in the early 90s, which was an absolutely revolutionary uh, evolution. You're seeing today a mature internet. Back then, uh, we didn't have the internet in the 90s, but everybody saw the future. Uh, the stock market got ahead of itself. We had five years of just stupid money available to do things, and I was able to take uh, advantage of that. And we had a, a correction in the early 2000s, uh, right around 9-11 and, and that time. If you're, You may all not be familiar with 9-11, but uh, we older people know what that was. So these students got to connect with a number of 9-11 uh, survivors and veterans. So they should all be familiar with 9-11 with because we kind of emphasize history here. Uh, even Good. if it's not taught in the textbooks, they know. We got a, a great question from Abel and I believe Abel is in Spain. Um, he has a question about uh, being a professional pilot. Right. Looks like we have some technical difficulties. He wants to know what advice would you have for a younger person who would like to be a pilot? Well, before I answer that, uh, Mr. Krauss made a great point. You need to know your history. There's an old saying, you who do not know history are bound to repeat it. So I couldn't encourage you more to find out what your elders, talk to your parents, your grandparents, find out what has happened before you and read, read, read. I encourage you dramatically. I love history. I've been a history major first and foremost. And I continue to this day to educate myself, even though I'm a little older than you are. Um, but uh, on being a pilot, uh, being a pilot is a terrific job. Uh, it requires a very uh, well-trained, high degree of skill to do those things. Uh, the industry has become, uh, the airplanes are very much uh, systems oriented these days. And by that, the older airplanes were a real stick and rudder where you were flying the airplane as a pilot. Today, the automation in the pilot cockpit is very sophisticated to the point that an airplane will take itself off, fly the route that you get, tell it to fly, and land itself. Having said that, the crew, uh, the first officer and the captain are necessary to make sure that the safety aspects, uh, you know, in this industry uh, here in the U.S. in particular, uh, we haven't had a fatal accident since 2009. It's unheard of what we're doing in the safety aspects of it. But the pilots uh, are critical to that. It takes a while. You need to learn basic skills, basic airmanship. Uh, and then, you know, you, you move on and fly in some lesser uh, air, you know, environments here in the U.S. Overseas, um, for instance, if you are in Europe and you work, want to go to work for Lufthansa, they'll, they'll pick you out if they, you have the right, uh, you know, mindset and the like. And they will train you to be a pilot for them. It'll take about a year, year and a half to do it, but uh, it's not for everybody, mind you, but it's, you know, there the training is a lot easier than frankly here in the States. And uh, we have a question from uh, a uh, class at Glenn Taylor Elementary here in Nevada, and they wanna know how has COVID affected the operations uh, at Allegiant? Well, COVID has affected everybody's life. We've all become hermits in the last year as we, we stopped the, the you know, the one great uh, aspect of our uh, uh, biology, we're all connected. We all have the same chemistry and, and yeah, there's bits and pieces that are different, but we take for granted our ability to socialize and get up close and personal with, you know, friends and relatives and 
you know, older people are going to, you know, places to have drinks, bars, as they call them, and movies, whatever. Uh, and why you've been able to do that is through millions of years of evolution, we have this thing called our immune system that goes after all these, these foreign bodies. Um, the current system uh, is not good enough in certain cases with the current uh, COVID stuff. And, uh, you know, you see a, a much more contagious disease than uh, we've historically been, and it's the perfect virus, if you will. The perfect virus doesn't kill its host. It just makes them sick and lets you go out and, and transmit the uh, disease to others, right? Because it, it, like everything else, wants to grow. Uh, for an little data point, last year, we literally eliminated flu from the United States because we wore masks. That's, that was a revelation to the medical community, but it shows that flu wasn't nearly as contagious as you see the COVID uh, situation is. But in the airline space, uh, we were able to keep flying. Um, you know, it was a tough environment. Our pilots and flight attendants and station people were on the front lines seeing new people all the time. And that was the great fear of seeing people you didn't know in particular. Um, it was uh, tough for everybody in the, in the hospitality and airline space. Uh, our revenues went down to virtually nothing for a month in the month of April from substantial amount. Uh, people stopped moving around. Um, we're seeing people come back. Uh, Allegiance doing as well or better than anybody at this point because we're very leisure focused. Um, a coincident problem for a few of the big guys, uh, American, Delta, and United in the United States, is that uh, the business traffic has not come back. And you know why the business traffic isn't coming back sooner? It's because of what we're doing right now. This technology was really, you know, not very well known or used certainly prior to this. And now people have discovered it. They know how to make it work. And so we're, we're probably going to see a very slow return of business traffic if it comes back at all to the levels it was before COVID. Uh, what kind of advice would you have for a young person who would like to run a business? Um, very good. I was going to comment on that. You know, um, one of the things that you, uh, and it's a great thing to be looking backwards, you don't know what your future holds for you. Um, in life, uh, the happiest people in life will be the folks that look forward to the journey and look forward to the, the, the times you're gonna fall and skin your knee, you're gonna stub your toe. You will learn so much more through experience than having people do things for you. Do not be afraid, stick your head out. If, if, if you wanna be a business person, uh, go to work for people that will let you do the most and teach you the most. Do not worry about the money you make first job. Because um, in my case, I, I kind of wandered around for six, seven, eight years in the 70s without a, a, you know, a, a full-time job. It was a tough decade, like I mentioned earlier. And I didn't get into the airline space uh, probably for six, five, six, seven years after I was done with school. Um, so it's, it, it seems frustrating. You know, you, you know, one of the things my children have told me is that the internet and uh, social media tends to make everybody else feel that they're not doing nearly as well as their friends. Come to find out that, uh, you know, when they talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, oh yeah, everybody seems to have the same feeling. Everybody's got problems. Everybody, particularly in their 20s, your late teens, when you get there, you're gonna be unsure of what to do. Put your head down, keep, keep taking one step after the next and, and you know, chase a dream, be, be passionate, do those things that are really part of uh, you know being your age and uh, enjoy your peers too. Um, but don't worry so much about being an overnight success and all the stuff you see on television, on the media about people that are instant hits. You know, there's, there's very seldom an instant hit. You have to put the work in to, do, to become good. Music, uh, writing, literature, uh, whatever, it's, it's, it's hard work, but that's okay. Hard work is good. Absolutely. Em emphasizing that importance of hard work. And you touched on the whole human element. Uh, and I, I wanted to kind of go further into that because we got a question from some of the students in Florida and they wanted to know about your philanthropic work and the importance of giving back and uh, what inspired you uh, with your philanthropic work with University of California, Davis. Um, well, I've been incredibly fortunate. Um, you know, one of the, the great things about uh, the United States in particular and, and uh, 
uh, the Western world is that uh, people are allowed to achieve and, and do what they want to do and follow their dreams, if you will. I was, you know, a very middle class person. Uh, you know, my my father, you know, worked uh, nine to five, just like most everybody. And I grew up uh, in, a, in a very blessed environment, frankly, but uh, there was no special uh, requirements or things that I was going to be, you know, given, if you will. I had to go get it myself. And, um, you know, uh, but when you do get, um, you know, I find my lifestyle is uh, I don't consume nearly a, the amount of money I've been able to make. And so what do you do with that? Well, you, you give it back and you help people and uh, you do things that uh, I'm a big believer in the, you know, the biblical statement of you teach someone how to fish. You don't so much give them fish. Uh, you need to learn how to get a skill. People need to understand. Uh, and if you have a problem place where people are having uh, difficult times, you definitely want to give people a hand. Um, you know, uh, as far as Davis, uh, I really enjoyed that school when I was there. Um, I thought well of it. And uh, they uh, had an interesting project that, uh, you know, caught my fancy and um, uh, they put it together and uh, I made an investment, if you will. Um, life is all about investments. You only get back what you invest. Nothing ever shows up for free. So that uh, school made an investment in me. So I invested back in it. And uh, if we have any students out in California or plan on going to UC Davis, definitely check out Maurice J. Gallagher Hall, uh, named after our guests uh, here today. Uh, but before we let you go, um, you've been described as uh, an, a Renaissance man, an industry leader in multiple industries. What kind of advice could you impart on these kids as they go out in the world and kind of figure out what they want to do? Uh, you know, you, uh, I go back to the journey uh, aspect. You know, you have to, one of the great things, if you're, if you're able to have a passion when you're 15 and know that it's your life's work, you're, you're kind of lucky. The majority of us did not know that. And in fact, may change, you know, things they don't discover what they really want to do till they're in their 30s, maybe 40s. But you need to take that step and keep stepping every day. Uh, take care of business, be good to people, but be good to yourself first and foremost. And, you know, you need to take care of the vessel. It's your body. You know, don't don't over abuse it. Exercise. You know, it keeps you sharp. And, uh, you know, learn. Just continue to learn and read. Uh, you know, uh, I give my my oldest boy a hard time. He says that uh, I give they won't. My kids don't read books. And I, I but he seems to know a lot. And I said, where the hell do you figure out how the, all this stuff? He says, I read on the Internet. OK, that's good. Internet's good. But. Books are books are also very good. I think I just I can't ed education never stops. You think you're you can't be glad when you get out of you know uh, grade school or high school or college. Believe me, that's when your real education starts. Because candidly, you know the schools that you're in are good to teach you basic life skills, but they're not going to create uh, you uh, the skills you need. For instance, to come into Allegiant and be useful, we're going to have to train you at that point to be useful to us. So uh, just just look at it as a journey, and uh, you only get one of them too. It, it, you can't. The most valuable element you have in your life is time, because this seconds we've talked here are never going to be back again, and you only get them one time. So use them, be good. You're gonna you're gonna fall, skin your knee. You're gonna have problems, but get your butt up off the ground and keep walking.